Thank you very much, Professor Ohayon, for such an uh, introduction. And thank you for bringing your prestigious uh, conference here to New York and to the United States, a uh, conference that you do yearly in commemoration of the Yom HaPlitim, the Day of Jewish Refugees, that we were also instrumental in passing that law in, in Israel, in the Israeli Knesset several years ago. Um, my dear friend, Ambassador Dani Dayan, uh, we certainly will be a privilege and honor to welcome you into our tribe, even as an honorary uh, presence. And my very, very dear friend, Eli Kohanim, congratulations on your post at the State Department. And we are so privileged to be the recipient of your first official address as the Deputy Monitor in Combat Anti-Semitism at the State Department. <laughs> my dear friend, Jason Goberman, my dear friends in the audience, distinguished professors and lecturers. I will be, being that I'm the first lecturer, I'm gonna give a brief historical survey of the life of Jews in Arab lands. Then I'm going to be giving, hopefully, a brief personal and family history. And lastly, I will be giving the uh, legal background to our plight and our struggle. So a major obstacle to the elusive peace in the Middle East is the issue of the so-called Palestinian refugee problem. Yet, a key component to understanding this problem has been overlooked, ignored, and obscured in the current dialogue. This component is the history of the human rights violations and the ethnic cleansing of the Jews from Arab lands. These Arab Jews and their descendants compose over 50% of the population of Israel, the issues surrounding the Palestinian refugees are frequently addressed at the United Nations and in the Security Council, in the news media, and all legal journals. <clears throat> Very little has been written about the Jews displaced from Arab lands. More and more we are hearing about it and reading about it in the last decade. Out of almost 100, uh, 1,120 United Nations resolutions on Israel and the so-called Palestinians, Almost 200 resolutions deal specifically with Palestinian refugees. By contrast, not a single one deals exclusively with Jewish refugees displaced from Arab countries. Jews constituted a stable and historic community in these countries, as it was mentioned already, dating back at least 3,000 years, centuries and millennia before Muhammad and the advent of Islam. The Aleppo Syrian community, for example, dates back to King David, 3,000 years. The Yemenite community to King Solomon, 2,900 years. The Iraqi and Iranian community, Persian community, dates back, as it was mentioned, to the first Babylonian exile, 2,500 years. And the Egyptian community, over 1,000 years. And if we want to count it from the time of Moses, that's 3,400 years. <laughs> So since the time of Muhammad and the Islamic conquest in 622 of the North African tribes and the Iberian Peninsula, the legal status of Jews in Arab lands <clears throat> has been based on the Quran, which sets forth the laws governing both the religious and secular life of all Muslims. Jews were known as believers and as such were not given the choice were not giving the choice to either adopt Islam or death, but they were giving a third choice, that of submission. Therefore, coexistence between Jews and Muslims required that the Jews be submissive to the Muslims. This coexistence dates back from the time of Muhammad and his late successor, Caliph Omar. People subjected to Muslim rule were given protection from death and, co and conversion as the dhimmis, which we all know about. This protection required that the dhimmis pay the poll tax known as the jazia, or fine. The dhimmis, of course, were forbidden from testifying against Muslims, from owning a home, from holding office, from bearing arms, and from drinking wine in public. They could not build their houses higher than Muslim houses. They could not ride on saddles. They could not display their Torah except in their synagogues. Neither could they raise their voice when reading or blowing the shofar and were required to wear a special emblem on their clothes. Yellow for Jews. Yes, that famous yellow star 
was not a Nazi invention. It was their duty to recognize the superiority of the Muslim and accord him honor. This codified discrimination against the dhimmis permitted them to become scapegoats and made vulnerable to mob action, assault, rape, torture, and humiliation by their Muslim and Arab hosts. After the Inquisition and the expulsion of the Jews from Spain in 1492, the Muslim world once again became home to hundreds of thousands of new revitalized centers of Jewish life. It was not an easy resettlement. Many died in the plagues, in crossfire between factions and people, and many were sold into captivity. Together with the decline of the Ottoman Empire and the fortunes of the Sephardim mirrored this gradual deterioration. Anarchy replaced government everywhere in the Muslim world. It led to a rise in personal insecurity and abuse of all minorities, including the Jews. The conspicuous misery of the Jews struck many visitors to Muslim lands in the 18th and 19th centuries. The Italian Jewish poet, for example, Samuel Romanelli, paid a visit to Morocco in the late 1700s and he found Jews to be to, there to be, and I, I quote, oppressed, miserable creatures, having neither the mouth to answer an Arab nor the check to raise their head. There was forced labor. Jews were even pulled out of the synagogue on the Sabbath to work. The Englishman William Lane, who visited Cairo in the 1800s, wrote, and I quote, a Jew scarcely ever dared to utter a word of abuse when reviled or beaten unjustly by the nearest, by the meanest Arab or Turk. For many a Jew has been put to death upon a false and malicious accusation of uttering disrespectful words against the Quran. It is a common sense to see an Arab abuse his donkey by calling the beast a Jew." End of quote. Also, the French visitor Mouet in the 17th century noted about the Jews of Morocco, and I quote, they rarely go alone in the countryside because the Arabs and Berbers slaughter them for the most part. There is practically never justice for them in these lands. They are required to go barefoot outside their quarter, end of quote. Also, the traveler Lamprière in the 18th century commented, and I quote, in every country where they reside, these unfortunate people are treated as another class of beings, end of quote. So Jews who went out after dark in Tunis were not permitted to carry lantern. If they had to pass the Kasbah, they were required to fall prostrate as a sign of submission, and they walked with lowered heads. Discriminatory clothing regulations were applied to Jews in most part of the Muslim world also exposing the Jews to public abuse from all quarters. In the haras, or the ghettos of Tunisia, the burnouses worn by Jews could only be blue or black, their shoes and caps black. In Jab, southern Algeria, Jews were required to dress only in black and they were forbidden to emigrate. Arab children would pelt Jews in the street. The relative intolerance of the Islamic world in medieval times was replaced by profound contempt. Iran's deplorable situation of the Jews was not different. A European visitor writes, and I quote, at every public festival at the royal palace, Jews were collected and a number of them flung into a tank filled with water and mud so that the king and mob may be amused by seeing them crawl out half drowned and covered with mud." End of quote. And the persecution of Persian Jews culminated in the forced conversion of the Jews of Mashhad in 1839. In Yemen, Jewish orphans were snatched to be raised as Muslims, and Jewish adults were required to clean the public latrines. The infamous Crown Decree required the Jews of Yemen to go bareheaded. The rabbi of Algiers was beheaded in a Muslim revolt against the military governor at the beginning of the 19th century. In February 1840, a Capuchin monk known as Father Thomas disappeared in Damascus, Syria. 
because he was a Sardinian under French protocol protection, the French consul rounded up several Jews as suspects and proceeded to interrogate and torture them under the baseless suspicion that they had something to do with the disappearance of the monk. And he was a part of a Jewish plot of ritual murder. Under torture, several prisoners, of course, confessed, quote unquote, others died or converted to Islam. The blood libel spread like wildfire to engulf the entire Middle East and even the Balkans, the Jews of Rhodes, Beirut, and Smyrna. This became known as the Damascus Affair. As the 20th century began with World War I and then World War II, the Jewish communities in North Africa and the Middle East went through significant changes, including torture, imprisonment, ghettoization, alienation, and of course, murder too. The Vichy forces, for example, in Morocco began to implement racial laws, confiscation, and ghettoization against the Jews. In Algeria, 150,000 Jews lost their citizenship. And in Tunisia, Jews were conscripted in forced labor camps notorious for harshness. German occupation of Tunisia brought the condition of the 90,000 Jews from bad to worse. Nazis began deporting Jewish leaders to concentration and extermination camp, and many of those died there. <coughs> Excuse me. The Jews of Iraq were not spared. The pro-Nazi Mufti of Jerusalem has been given asylum in Iraq, and the Iraqi government helped a pogrom against the Jews that killed 179 Jews, while British troops stood by and did nothing. During this incident known as the Farhud, women were raped, babies were smashed, in, smashed in, front, in front of their parents or thrown into wells. Pregnant women were mutilated and Torah and synagogues were desecrated. When the United Nations voted to partition historical Palestine into a Jewish and an Arab state, Jews and Arab lands became the target of a frustrated Arab mobs. Official discrimination, persecution, and expulsion took place, leading to Jewish communities to flee for their lives in many places with only the clothes that they were wearing and leaving everything behind. The situation of the Jews in the Arab countries worsened dramatically, since many Arab countries declared war or supported the war against Israel. In virtually all Arab countries, official decrees and legislation condoned by the Arab League itself as an official position, <clears throat> promulgated by the Arab regimes, denied human and civil rights to Jews. They expropriated their property, stripped of their citizenship, and other means of subsistence. Jews were often victims of murder, arbitrary arrest, detention, torture, and expulsion. The end result, the massive displacement of nearly one million Jews from their birth country from, Arab, from the 10 Arab countries. In Libya in 1945, for example, anti-Jewish rioters stormed into the community crying, Jihad full kuffar, holy war against the infidels, killing 130 Jews in three days, and the British colonial administrators were unwilling to protect the defenseless communities, as usual. By and large, British colonial administrators in the Arab world stood by as the Jews were attacked by the Arab mobs. In, 1950s, in the 1950s, excuse me, nine years after the Farhud in Iraq, the Jewish community was terrified by the bombing of synagogues and other Jewish sites, show trials and public hanging of prominent Jewish leaders, and the dismissal of all Jewish government employees. In a dramatic clandestine escape, 125,000 Jews of Iraq immigrated en masse to Israel. In 1960, Algeria's 150,000 Jews chose immigration to France when a wave of anti-Jewish violence erupted during Algeria's independence. In Yemen, Operation Magic Carpet and Wings of Eagle transported almost the entire Jewish community of 45,000 on 430 flights between June 1949 and September 1950, flights sponsored by the State of Israel. In Egypt, departures ebbed and flowed, flowed, flowed as each new Arab-Israeli 
war brought about a temporary lifting of restriction on emigration as Jews were either expelled or imprisoned. <clears throat> Excuse me. A new conflict would become the catalyst for new attacks upon the Jewish property, the taking of Jewish lives, or the imprisonment of thousands of Jews. Ultimately, practically the entire Jewish Egyptian community of 80,000 was dispersed in stages. Today, for all intent and purposes, Sephardic Jewish life in Muslim land has ended. I have here a, 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 um, a table showing exactly how many Jews, I'm not gonna go through all of it, but to let you know that in Egypt today, there are seven Jews left. There were eight when I was there in February. One of them just passed away like a month ago, so there are only seven Jews. Four in, uh, four in uh, Cairo, three in, in Alexandria. In Iran, as was mentioned already, 15 to 18,000. In Lebanon, less than 30 people and not known where they exist. There's no Jewish community. In Morocco, less than 2,000. In Syria, there are now 13 Jews only, as far as I know. Tunisia, we have like 1,000. Yemen, less than 100. So we are talking about a total of maybe 16, 17, or 18,000 Jews out of 1 million. Let me share with you my personal and family history, story, actually. It is known that Yoav ben Seruya, the commander-in-chief of the King David's Arab, uh, uh, armed forces, captured what, is known today, what is, was known then as Aram Sova, or Aleppo, and he built a tower and fortress which formed the foundation of the ancient fortifications that can still be seen in Aleppo today, believed to be the citadel of Aleppo. Now, Jews have been living in Aleppo for thousands of years. The Jewish community in Syria formed a central link in the unbroken chain of Jewish settlements throughout the Fertile Crescent, which stretched from ancient Israel to Babylonia. Soon after the 1947 United Nations partition vote, riots, anti-Jewish riots broke out throughout Syria and Aleppo, in fact, throughout the whole Middle East, but in Aleppo, synagogues were set afire, Jewish shops and houses were pillaged, and thousands of Aleppo Jews were forced to flee the country. During the synagogue burning on the 8th of Kislev, corresponding to December 1st, yesterday we commemorated the 72nd anniversary of those harayi known, those rioters entered the great synagogue and pillaged it. My own parents fled for their lives when the mobs, as they lived right next door to the great synagogue, as the mob, aided by the police that they had once trusted, began burning synagogues and sifret Torah in what became known as the Haraye, the burnings. That day, Syrian rioters entered the buildings of which my parents were living and in which many of the Jewish community was living right next to the synagogue and the neighborhood. In minutes, my mother heard screams from all around the area. They are beating Jews, destroying their property, looting stores, ruining businesses and in this way altering the course of the Sephardic Jewish community of Aleppo forever. Under the persistent repression of the authorities from 1947 to 1990s, many members of the Jewish community sustained the risk in order to escape the persecution. Many attempts at escaping ended in tragedies with innocent Jews being tortured and murdered. Today, Syria has less, as I said, than 13 Jews living in the country mostly in Damascus. A Jewish community that originated over 3,000 years is no more. Escape was risky as the gates, the gates were shut down and Syrian police patrolled the border, keeping Jews as prisoners. Those that dared to try and bribe a well-connected official or work outside the border where no one would see them were mostly unsuccessful. Instead, they were being killed, tortured, or arrested in the process. My own parents hid in my grandparents' house further away from the synagogue. Then a few days later, they made separate attempts to try and escape. My mother obtained a doctor's permit and took my older brothers to the Lebanese mountain where the weather was clearer and cleaner. And it was a promise of a healthier life awaiting them since one of my brothers was ill for over one year. My father escaped, took a different path. He tried to smuggle himself out of the country, 
and was caught several times. Just when he thought he was unsuccessful yet again, he was caught in the street of Aleppo, and he realized that he was actually caught by a Syrian guard he happened to know, who surreptitiously warned him of his impending arrest. And he told him, look, you're being per pursued by the authorities because you are tried to escape a few times, and I have orders to arrest you. So I'm coming back to arrest you tomorrow. <laughs> My father understood and needed no stronger hint <laughs> to escape that night. So with the help of some friends, he boarded the train with a small, 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 even attaché case, not even a suitcase. He took the train that night to Lebanon and enlisted the help of a train official with whom he had acquainted as he traveled many times clandestinely before. The man, the conductor, hid him in the cargo load and told him he could not breathe, sneeze, or move any muscle as they approached the border during inspection or else they would both be dead. My father hid that way for hours, his fear intensifying once the train reached the border. Police searched the cargo load very well, and when they got to his wagon, he was certain he would be discovered. But luckily, the officer who was searching got distracted by the conductor outside <laughs> and moved on to another wagon. He was saved miraculously, he believes but knew he could not remain idle. As soon as they reached the border, now the Lebanese one, my father jumped off of the moving train and into a ravine. Amazingly, aside from a few bruises, he was unscathed and began to walk th through the rough Lebanon terrain in search for his family. He traveled by night so as not to be seen and eventually reunited with his wife, my mother, his siblings, his, his children, my siblings leaving everything behind in Syria except that small bag that he had. So it was the creativity of my mother and the courage of my father that brought them to relative safety. Had my father been caught, I would not have been standing here today to tell you the story. I would not have been born. Though Lebanon was relatively peaceful, our status, status always remained as refugees, even though most of my siblings, including myself, were born in Lebanon. We could never leave the country because no other country wanted to receive us, we were refugees. We could not move about the country without refugee identity cards. Yes, we were allowed to live in the country, but not as free, really free citizens. During the, during the next 22 years in Lebanon, living as Jewish refugees, we lived through the 1956 Sinai campaign, 1958 Lebanese civil war, and 1967 six-day war. We endured discrimination, fear of persecution, and hid our identities most of the time. After Black September and the transferring of the PLO leadership to Lebanon in 1969, the Jewish community felt threatened and began to flee Lebanon. One day, a poster-sized picture was plastered on many mosques all over Lebanon. The picture was of the three rabbinical leaders, which included my father. This is the picture. It has been famous. has been all over the, the place. All dressed in their rabbinical garb with their talit. The caption under the picture read, these are the Zionist Jewish leaders who are helping Jews escape to Israel. <clears throat> Needless to say, that makes you a target in Lebanon. For weeks, my father and the rest of the rabbis hid to be secure, and they started planning their uh, travel out of Lebanon. My mother wrote a letter to my oldest brother who was in Mexico to plead with the government of Mexico to allow us to immigrate. Finally, after many years, that request came through, and it came on the eve of Passover 1971, when we received a telex. In those days, there was no texting, WhatsApp, or cell phones. It was a telex with only a few words saying, quote, happy Passover. You are free at last. Mexico is waiting for you. And as you know, we felt as though we were, uh, we were saved and redeemed from Egypt that Passover. So my story, again, is not a unique one. It's like almost one million Jews from Arab countries that they suffer. So the sense of Jews displaced from Arab countries is multifaceted. There's the loss of one's country, the loss of one's home, the loss of leaving a life behind. 
There's also the loss of history, the loss of one's community, the loss of holy sites, and painfully, the loss of family remains in cemeteries left behind. We have a moral responsibility to protect the legacy and the right a, to right a long-standing historical injustice. Asserting rights and redress for Jewish refugees is a legitimate call to recognize that Jewish refugees from Arab countries as a matter of law and equity possess the same rights as all other refugees. The first injustice was the mass violation of human and civil rights of Jews in Arab countries. Today, we must not allow a second injustice which is for the international community to continue to recognize right for one victim population, Arab refugees, without recognizing equal rights for other victims of that very same Middle East conflict, Jewish refugees from Arab countries. The road to the future includes the following. One, revise all educational material in elementary, high school, and colleges to reflect the true history of the Jewish people, including the history of the Jews from Arab countries. Two, bring the history of the Jews of the Arab countries in all international fora, educational, social, political, and human rights. Three, find a way for financial compensation and redress for the violations of their rights, property, and life. Four, restoration and safeguarding of their heritage sites in all Arab countries. So the Jewish refugees from Arab countries demand the right to memory, the right to truth, the pursuit of justice, the right of redress, and compensation, the right to educate and the rest ourselves and the rest of the world, and protection and restoration of heritage sites. So the pursuit of truth and the right to justice and redress is imperative, prerequisites to reconciliation between people as well as in between states. And these are the truth, and briefly in the next two, two minutes. One, it is a fact that the number of Jewish refugees far exceeds the number of Arab Palestinian refugees almost two to one. Two, it is a fact that many of the Arab Palestinian refugees were active combatants in the war against Israel and not only innocent bystanders, why not a single one Jewish refugee was a combatant against any Arab country. Three, the war for the independence of Israel was a defensive war and was not directed against the Palestinian Arab population, while the Arab governments directed specifically their war against their Jewish population. Four, the Arab-Palestinian refugees were not expelled nor persecuted from the land of Israel. An absolute majority was encouraged to leave by their own Arab brothers and by Arab governments so they could have an easier time to wipe out the Jewish yeshuv in Israel and they promised them that they will return. Five, it is a fact that the dollar value of properties confiscated from the Jews and forced to be left behind in Arab countries is 10 times than the value of the property left by Arab Palestinian refugees. Our properties are estimated to be at $300 billion, if not more, while their property is estimated to be at $30 billion, as by their own estimates. Six, the land area of real estate confiscated and left by the Jews from Arab lands in the Arab countries is estimated to be at 40,000 square miles. Now, guess what that is? It is five times the size of Israel. It is the size of Jordan and Kuwait combined, or the size of Jordan and Lebanon combined. Seven, all the Jewish refugees were absorbed either by Israel or other countries in the world. Eight, Arab Palestinian refugees are still in refugee camps around the Middle East, illiterate, living in squalor, dirt, without good sewage, potable water, or decent living all due to the unwillingness of Arab government to absorb them and give them those services. There are even refugee camps in areas under Palestinian Authority rule today. For the life of me, I don't understand why are they wait, what are they waiting to settle them? The authority already rules over that land for 20 years. Nine, a special agency was established for the Arab Palestinian refugees in 1948, the UNRWA, infamous UNRWA, while no other groups of refugees in the world has even had its own United Nations agency. 10, Arab Palestinian refugees have already received over $80 billion from the United Nations through UNRWA and other agencies, while the Jewish refugees received zero dollars. Lastly, the time has come to rectify this historical injustice by restoring the plight and truth of justice for Jewish refugees from Arab lands and Muslim countries. 
The remembrance, truth, justice, and redress for Jews displayed from Arab and Muslim countries must be pursued as mandated under human rights and humanitarian law. And in the interest of truth, justice, and reconciliation, individual Arab and Muslim states and the Arab League must acknowledge their role and responsibility in the persecution and displacement of their Jewish population. And in the interest of justice and equity, United Nations General Assembly resolutions must include reference to Jewish refugees. The United Nations Human Rights Council should address, as it never has, the issue of Jewish refugees as well as it does for Palestinian refugees. And pursuant to the principle of equal voice, the annual November 29 commemoration by the United Nations of the International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian people should be transformed into an International Day of Solidarity with all refugees, including Jews. And lastly, as Minister Irving Cutler once said, let there be no mistake about it. Whether there is no where there is no remembrance, there is no truth. Where there is no truth, there will be no justice. Where there is no justice, there will be no reconciliation. And where there is no reconciliation, there will be no peace. Thank you very much. <laughs>